Hey everyone, Tom here. Well, it's time for us to have a discussion about everything that's going on in markets right now. And as we approach all-time highs for Bitcoin, there's a lot to discuss. NFTs are back and FOMO is taking control with a $16 million transaction going through over the last 24 hours. But who's correct? Is it JP Morgan claiming there's froth or Goldman Sachs saying the rally is justified? Today, we'll talk about the bull and the bear case scenarios for all markets around the world, including Bitcoin, the rise of gold, whether it can get frothy as well, and of course, the weakness in the Magnificent 7 with Apple breaking through and closing well below its support zones. But really, it comes down to a few charts, and today we'll talk about them all together, including stocks, commodities, and cryptos. Well, welcome back, everybody, to The Daily Show, where we talk about markets around the world, including the macro lead indicators and the hottest charts. Just a quick reminder before we get started into today's content, we have our release of the weekly newsletter coming. Make sure to sign up for it. Links in the description down below. It's as easy as email and name. Let's move over to what's going on in the world right now, because, of course, everyone's talking about crypto and Bitcoin. It's trending everywhere, and it just surpassed silver in terms of market capitalization size. Now, this will become very important when it comes to projecting what Bitcoin could realistically be doing this halving cycle. And we are in a cycle. Of course, we've talked about this idea. The four-year crypto cycle is pretty well known. Everyone's trading off it. And it seems like Wall Street is also getting in on this type of thing. So what does that mean? Well, it kind of brings us back to how good could it get? Well, let's think about market capitalization size for a moment. Let's say that gold is around $12 trillion plus right now, and that Bitcoin is sitting in the $1 plus trillion kind of price range. Well, the thing about this is that it is fair to state that a certain percentage of money should be allocated to Bitcoin. It is, after all, an alternative asset. And now that we have the exchange-traded funds, just hear me out here, one of the things that tends to happen is that big fund managers around the world will allocate. Now, this is nothing new. We've spoken about it several times in our live streams and during the daily show. But I want to just quickly talk you through what I think is possible from a market capitalization size. Let's say that Bitcoin joins around one third of the overall market cap of gold. Therefore, it's allocated maybe one to two, two and a half percent of the general asset allocation that you tend to see in a lot of these funds then you're probably moving to around a $4 trillion market cap for the particular coin. And I think between three and $4 trillion is certainly a possibility throughout this halving cycle as this particular market does mature. And you might not think the Bitcoin's worth anything, but I can tell you that the ETFs will be bringing in a whole bunch of this money. And of course, we are seeing it in flows. Now let's talk about, though, whether we're getting a little bit too FOMO-ish. And I would say absolutely at this stage. Now, of course, I have also spoken about some stats that were to do with three-day gains of plus minus 18, usually going sideways for a while. But just remember, Bitcoin's well known to have pumpy pumpy and dumpy dumpy. And it won't be any different this halving cycle. It always pumps, it always dumps. And that's just generally what happens. And it always is when you least expect it. Now, could it be around the halving itself? Well, it tends to be so. If you look at previous halving cycles, you often kind of drop a little bit or even go sideways for a while after the halving event. And of course, that's coming up relatively soon for crypto around the world. So that's just a couple of my thoughts. But the other one is, of course, to do with the liquidity around the world right now. Financial conditions continue to lessen, which basically means that it's easier to get debt. It's easier to borrow in general. And that usually is great for hyper growth stocks. And they haven't gone, by the way, just yet. And of course, it's great for things like cryptocurrencies and realistically anything else that's risk on. So just remember, as long as financial conditions remain relaxed, which they are relaxing, it is a good sign for the cryptoverse. Before we go to the charts later on for Bitcoin and for a few other things, I want to talk about stock markets, though, because, of course, we've started to see the signs of, again, maybe a couple of flashings of red, including the bonds market. Index put call skew has only been significantly lower back in 1997, which obviously has a few people raising their eyebrows of how could we be here and not seeing some weakness in markets. We're also seeing, of course, buybacks going out of control again, which is helping to realistically help the markets to actually go up, liquidity being provided. And of course, we have the super core inflation this week where the Federal Reserve will come out and Jerome Powell will tell us whether he really cares about this or not, because of course, inflation is on the rise. 
But there are some other things going on in markets right now. One of the big ones is other opportunities and they're everywhere. There are literally opportunities everywhere in a market that turns into FOMO. One of the things we've been talking about over the last couple of days has been gold. And the reason is we saw CTAs increase their positioning in gold over the last couple of weeks. And obviously with that was accompanied by one of our favorite things, which is a price action breakout. Now we'll bring up the charts later on, but it looks like gold could be moving to a new all-time high as well. Some other things for the bears, things like exchange traded call options, obviously getting elevated back to previous periods where we did see some selling in markets, although we're going to need more on the S&P 500. And we'll talk about the key levels very, very soon. Another one is, of course, to do with the bonds market. We're starting to see signs of weakness in bonds while we're seeing still strength in stocks and strength across many other market constituents. Now, that's a bit of an issue because, of course, if we do have strength in the market and weakness in bonds, ultimately over a couple of weeks and months, you, if that continues, you really want to be trusting the bonds, not the stock market. We did talk about NVIDIA the other day. And of course, the idea that after its earnings announcement, we saw some insiders selling. We've also gone to around $860 plus, and we've slapped that straight back down along with SMCI over the last 24 hours while it went up huge and then got dumped. Now, that means that probably a large trader is trying to get rid of a position, and we'll go through that later on. But obviously, we'll talk about the strategies that you could employ over those periods. Now, will we get a pullback? This is the million dollar question that a lot of people are asking. This is just a different study between 1949 and 2023, where you can see here that there's still a chance that we may get weakness throughout the March period. And obviously, we find ourselves in that March period right now. Do we have price action to go with it? The short answer is not yet. And of course, you'll need to be looking at that. For longer term hodlers, is everything looking pretty good? Yes, the market is looking fairly good. And overall, I think we're in kind of a similar dot-com type of bubble boom where we have that AI kind of run that's going to last for years as new technology, new advancements, and all new things come through. I wouldn't be surprised if we're in a market that is going to go for not only in the next 12 months, but also a couple of years here as we see debt increasing around the world. And you watch these financial conditions getting looser. It's just unfortunately the ways it does tend to go. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not getting a pullback, which of course we talked about later before. And of course, you saw in that other chart, there were significant pullback opportunities during that huge run. So is the Russell 2000 going to be where the market goes to next? It seems kind of likely that is the way it's going to be. The MAG7 obviously coming under quite a lot of scrutiny over the recent couple of days. And really, the MAG7 is trading off one simple concept. And that concept is that we are not going to see regulation in AI. Now, if you do get regulation in AI, you watch them drop. The market's booming big on the idea of an unregulated AI market for quite a few more years. And I'd say they're probably correct. I think that we're in the age of data. And that basically means that countries around the world are not going to want to stifle their most innovative companies, at least for now. The market's pretty smart like that. 25 and zero is Wayne's study. And it's a pretty damn good study here for the rest of the year up until basically February of next year. So just remember, the markets are certainly geared towards quite a lot of strength moving forward. Where else could we be seeing weakness? Well, we're looking for weakness in quite a few signs. CTAs, Commodity Trade Advisors is one of them. We've been talking about these being a switch. And we did get a small update over the last 24 hours. Obviously, we can see here they are maxing. They're actually at the same heights they were back before we saw the sales in July and August of last year. Same thing for the CTA positioning for the NASDAQ, still very high. I'll get an update on that over the next 24 hours as well. So what are the other opportunities in the world? Well, of course, there's the China stocks we've been talking about recently. They've been doing pretty well. And of course, they've had a little pullback recently on the last 24 hours. We've got energy stocks potentially starting to look like they're breaking out, obviously one to watch. We've got big CTA increases across the board on energy positions, as you can see here as well with crude. And then we come to, of course, the options markets. Now, there's quite a lot going on in the options markets. First up, NVIDIA, 800 and 850 being the two big levels. And we hit 850 and obviously we're rejected off that. So a close above 850, that's going to expose 900 to even $1,000. And a close below 850 is obviously a slight negative in markets. And it's going across the world like this. It doesn't matter which market we're looking at. There are huge call walls across the world. And they've been pushing to each and every level, just like we talked about with 5100. The next stop was going to be 5150. The next stop from 5150 breakout is going to be 52, which is a huge level. 
and then of course 53, et cetera, et cetera. So we did just stop at 5150. So what's the next important zone? Getting back below 5100 is going to be a big deal. And also getting below, I believe, the 5050 zone. Now we all know that 5000 is the most struck level at this stage, but the 5050 zone is going to mean a lot for price action. So stay tuned for that. And of course, I'll be on the lookout for all the big options moves. It was not a good last 24 hours for Tesla. I've been talking it up a little bit about the idea of an AI play there in Tesla, but of course they dropped car prices. Not great for the resale for everybody else. And specifically they're doing it in China to try to compete. So obviously they're hurting there on the car side and they're going to need the AI side to start to take over in terms of good news story. It looks like number 30 trade was a sell. We're back down to around this level. But I think for Tesla long-term hodlers, they're going to be liking these prices. And obviously this is a lot better overall multiple than it has been in many previous periods for the stock. Treasuries continues to hover around waiting for Jerome Powell. So remember, we have a lot of trades there, but we are long-term positive on treasuries. And we did see that huge transaction go through the queues just on Friday. So obviously we've seen a sell since then. So it'll be interesting to see whether this sell continues because that was the number one largest trade that we've had in quite some time. And it doesn't just stop there. We've had some other weird trades coming through. You guys would know that I follow home builders quite a lot. Well, as it turns out, it looks like home builder and supplies bullet three X just got a massive dark pool transaction on it. So let's have a quick look here at the zero DTEs in terms of options. You can see the 5150 being such a big key level in terms of calls. A movement above 5150 is going to expose some call uh, wall breaking and you would think there's going to be some hedging of the market from then, probably exposing a squeeze. 5200 when it comes to this month's major expiration on the 15th. So you can see here that 5200, 5100 being also important. And as we can see, it's quite a large drop off when it comes to the overall trades. They're all concentrated around that 51, 50 and 5100 zone. In terms of earnings, there's still earnings coming up. Take a look at this chart. All of those will matter if you are trading those stocks. And I'll just quickly jump through these. I just thought I'd leave them in. Your comments were that you liked the idea of having every day broken down into what you're looking for. So you can pause the video here if you're interested in terms of checking out each and every one. And of course, here is also the overall economic calendar for the rest of the week as well. Let's go through rotation because of course it was a big uptick in gold. And as we reported in the last video, we thought gold would break out. GDX in a big way started up only around kind of like that one, 2%, but it ended up driving into the 4% barrier. And we also saw quite a large increase here in utilities with a huge sell-off near the end, particularly in semiconductors, which were doing well. So it was like a pumpy and then a little bit of dumpy by the end of the day. Remember, selling into the close is generally a large trader doing that, and that means it's probably Wall Street. So we'll be looking for more of that action on semis. If they keep selling into the close, it tells you someone important is getting rid of their positions. So let's move over to the charts now and take a look at what's going on. Now, here we have a little bit of a bond indicator. And what it's telling us is that if we breach through this kind of high here, we're literally looking at weakness. Stay tuned on the channel if that does happen. Basically, the chances of weakness are increasing every day this thing is up. And that is something that we've seen very correlated to markets, often an early indicator in terms of liquidity, it is wild to think that central bank liquidity, which we're tracking here, is actually improving across the board and we are facing a new all-time high in markets. You would think they want to tighten it, but that's not the way it's been and not the way it's working out at this stage. Let's move over now to a few other things. We've got, of course, yields going up a little bit more. Pushing that 4.75 will be a big zone. Just remember, have an alert at 4.78 just in case here for the US two-year. If that does happen... It's going to be wild for markets. At this point, though, it looks like yields still want to probably sell off more than they want to go up. High yield junk, it's been coiling now for months. And of course, a breakout of high yield junk, whether it's down or up, is going to be huge. When it coils and it breaks, it's usually explosive. So make sure to stay tuned to that and also stay tuned to the channel because we'll be following our bond indicator, which is also coiling at this stage. But do remember last week, showed the first signs of weakness. We've already talked about that. They're disconnected. If we get a new low on bonds here in terms of overall risk, then that's telling us that the market is probably cooked. And that's going to be very, very important. Remember, bonds will be correct more than the stock market will in the general idea of what's going on in the economy in terms of the markets. And so far, they've all been in lockstep with each other. 
But if that breaks down, it's going to be bad. Dollar index, yeah, it's in the middle of nowhere. Of course, I'm still favoring the euro for the long, which so far so good for that. But the DXY is clearly waiting for Jerome Powell and the jobs numbers later on this week. Where there's some good news is, of course, gold. And that's a very nice movement here. It looks like markets around the world are all in momentum. We first reported on that a few weeks ago and we basically started talking about momentum is everything. We're just not getting pullbacks at this stage because of the FOMO in these markets. So gold had a great weekly close. So far, so good. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see gold with a new all-time high in it this week. And that's because we did a poll and, and most people didn't think it was going to happen as well. It has been a long time coming. It's been consolidating for ages and obviously, it's part of a much larger kind of cup with handle style formation. In general, you could also call it a flag, but it has clearly broken out. So it looks like gold could be on. Speaking of what's happening here, we've got oil starting to weaken off again. Now, this one has been pulling back. This is an important zone that it's coming up into. So between 78 and 78.50 is where you'd like to see buyers recommit back to the gold, to the oil trade. And obviously, we'll be looking for that to occur USO versus SPY, still no breakout of this pattern. So we're looking for that to occur as well for energy to come back in. Now let's talk about the elephant because, of course, Tesla is weakening big time and it had huge amounts of problems. Of course, you've got Elon getting sued, Elon suing somebody else. And, and then on top of that, you've got weakness in the car demands. This company needs to switch into the AI side and get the good news rolling on. Obviously, they've got the robot. I'm not sure how that's going to work out for it, but remember that we are in the world of data. So as we talked about in our opening show on Monday, if you're a long-term supporter of Tesla, one of the biggest things is going to be data. You know, if you asked what was really driving the stock for 10 years, in many ways it was FSD, it was, you know, really the idea that cars would be driving themselves. Now no one talks about that anymore, but the data collection has been there. In general, if we do end up getting a robot off, just remember the data will be there. From a pure price action standpoint, though, that's a bad daily uh, candle, not very good. This is still around huge accumulation. Obviously, if you're a longtime supporter of Tesla, you could be thinking, well, this is weakness. Big trade went through there, as we already know, um, and I'm looking for this thing back into the 160s for strength. I still think there's going to be anywhere in here is not too bad uh, for a Tesla hodler, but uh, yeah, that's a bit of a disappointing closure, really breaking down a high, low, higher, high, and a lower, low which is um, not a positive sign for the, that particular trade. We're going to have to look for more evidence if you're looking for longs. Let's move over to NVIDIA, which basically sits around the 850 strike. And you can see here closing at 852 just. So it did get up there towards 877. Now, this is a little bit stronger than I would have thought it would be after that huge earnings, which pushed it up. And then around here, I would have thought it was probably going to go sideways up like this. And I still, I guess, think that that's generally the way. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm trading... Nvidia towards the weakness, guys. I'm a big bull on Nvidia. You know, I think we've gained seven trillion chips or something, some ridiculous amount, which hasn't even been allocated into any of the stocks yet. So just remember that it's not that you want to necessarily sell against it, although you could have with an option, and you still might be good for it, by the way, if you've given it enough time. But uh, yeah, it's been a very aggressive trend, and 852 is where we're sitting. So we're right on that core wall, and possibly even still looking at the upside for Nvidia. It just really depends on a lot what Bitcoin does. I think they're going to trade a little bit together because they're hyperactive. Now, this one, I saw a few of your comments laughing at me saying, ha ha, noob, um, look at it go up. Remember, replication is the key. So when we sold off 30% in only a few days, the idea was that we would bounce. Okay, cool, correct. Then the idea would be that we would go sideways to down for around three months. Now, this is traditionally what happens with these types of stocks. Of course, since then, We've got Bitcoin going wild. And of course, we've also had the inclusion in the S&P 500. So realistically, there's a few catalysts that have sent this one up, although it still did sell off, breaking back down to hold here. Now, if it starts to weaken, this is still within that game plan of a three-month sideways to down action. Uh, you know, I wouldn't buy it here if it was me. Uh, however, you know, good luck to you. Um, if it worked, it worked and well done. This here, totally different. There to there, I think it's pretty sweet. Here to here, possibly with an option. Um, and even if you're in an option short, you still should be alive because you've really got to give it at least until the back end of March, early April. Let's move over now to a couple of other stocks here and we'll talk about Apple. Apple continues to weaken, hits 175, finds a little bounce around it. Looks like it wants to go for 170. 
all of these big stocks, these these ones that people have traditionally liked have been falling though. Take a look at Google, fall into 134. And I think it's not done yet. It probably looks like it's going to 130, if not even into the 120s. Now it might be a good little pickup there because when you think about it, that type of reduction is going to be big time 22%. Now, if you go through and you think about, well, how far could it go? A lot of people are going to pull up things like fibs off the lows and they're going to say, well, 110 is possible. I think, you know, too early to tell on that one, but certainly weakness coming into one of the better stocks in the world. Let's now move over to the MAG7. As you can see here, long leg doji at the peak. So big breakout. And these are huge moves. I mean, that's a wild move up with a wild move down. And someone, no doubt, sold and closed some positions. So there was some profit taking. GDX, one of the good stories of the last 24 hours in the stock market. Nice little bounce here in old gold, old boomer Bitcoin, as I guess you would call it. Um, and we broke through, of course, the 20 moving average here with a nice big volume spike as well. So volumes back in. Gold seems to be getting a bit of the hype. It did this last time as well with Bitcoin. Now the question is, can it actually hold a new all-time high and then get a rally on? Because it's been a long time coming for that particular uh, old metal or currency, as I like to call it, the oldest currency in the world. What about the Hang Seng? Hang Seng weakening here at 16,180. So obviously coming off the whole uh, everything going on in China and all of the things that the party have announced. Uh, overall, still holding base. Needs to hold around here. We obviously don't really want to see a candle like this. This is fine. A new high and an alert. That would have been sweet. And that would have really triggered in further buying. But at this stage, it's just kind of holding around the zone. So we'll see whether it can hold up. The Lunar New Year's over. So obviously the seasonal's technically played out now. But uh, I'm still quietly confident there's some, some opportunities there this year. Let's move over to the Aussie market. Of course, that broke through to a new all-time high. So for now, it's in an upward trend. It's just doing the same thing as the US. Weakening with the US, but still holding the base lows. Let's move now to the US market. So the Russell 2000 went up and hit 2090. Now, if you know, that was actually a level I had for a while because that's why I've got it boxed. There's still a supply up here and I still think the Russell technically hasn't broken out. Signs are still higher highs and higher lows. So of course, positive for Russell traders, but it's right at that tip. This is where if a bear's going to come in, they're going to come in big time around this level. Now let's move to US 500. So I've got 50-50 um, as the peak key level here, and I think it's still big zone. Not only are there options around it, but also we can see the daily 20 moving average is sitting on as well and the previous low. So if we breach below that point, I think that's a big deal when it comes to the S&P 500. And until we're really underneath that level, it's going to be just really guessing that you're seeing any weakness signs. Of course, the close and the selling into the close, which you can see here with that last kind of bounce and then boom back down. This is a two-hour chart, by the way. That's not a great sign for markets. Moving into utilities is also a bit of a weakness uh, being shown in markets. So you can see here, if you go to utilities, they broke out over the last 24 hours, which is usually a pretty good time for them. And yeah, I mean, it's 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 got some signs, but they're really early. It's mostly bonds and mostly utilities and, of course, You've also got the selling into the close. Now, crypto, everyone's talking about it. I guess we probably got an all-time high, or maybe we didn't. Depends on the exchange, I guess, you're using. But uh, we are on a massive TD number. Now, basically, this usually marks at least a breathing room. Last time when we talked about the stat, we weren't with the TD. Of course, this does usually dictate, as you can see, a sideways action. So at this point, I would say it's exhausted, but hey, I said it was exhausted at 65 and 63. So around this period in time from a data perspective, here we have a data perspective and we've got one of the best indicators for reading off the back end of a trend. So at this stage, I would say that the market is possibly hitting a peaking zone. Everyone's FOMO, it's trending super hard. I'm a big fan of Bitcoin. As you can see, I think it could go to a three to $4 trillion valuation, which easily pushes it into the 150 to 200K range. So there's a good good chance that a Bitcoin could do that this cycle. I just have a feeling that it's gone harder than it's ever gone before into the halving cycle. So maybe it's going ready for some Wall Street manipulation. What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. Just a quick reminder, sign up for the newsletter. As I said, we're putting it out totally free. Follow us on other socials as well. And thank you so much for watching. Bye for now, guys.